نريد لبنان ملتقى وفاق عربي Good afternoon, thank you. You are watching the English newscast on Future Television. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Yumna Naufal and these are today's headlines. Iraqi officials say the death toll from a November 24th suicide bombing claimed by ISIS has risen to 92, including 40 Iranians. Syria's army advances deeper into East Aleppo, where it now controls more than half of the former rebel stronghold after a fierce assault that has sparked international outcry. And U.S. President-elect Donald Trump breaks with decades of foreign policy to speak with the president of Taiwan, prompting Beijing to accuse Taipei of a ploy. Thank you for tuning in. Iraqi officials say the death toll from a November 24th suicide bombing claimed by ISIS has risen to 92, including about 40 Iranians. The hospital and police officials say that another 105 people were wounded in the bombing at a gas station near the city of Hila, south of Baghdad. The latest death toll is an increase by 19 over the figure announced by officials a day after the attack, which targeted Shia pilgrims returning home after marking a major religious occasion in the holy city of Karbala. The officials attributed the rise in the death toll to the completion of the identification of bodies burnt beyond recognition. They spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak to the media. Syria's army advanced overnight deeper into East Aleppo, where it now controls more than half of the formal rebel stronghold after a fierce assault that has sparked an international outcry. Tens of thousands of civilians have fled eastern neighborhoods of the battered city since President Bashar al-Assad's regime began its latest offensive in mid-November. Overnight, government troops and allied forces seized the district of Tar el bab where heavy fighting enraged all day according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. The government has now recaptured around 60% of eastern parts of the city that rebels overran in mid-2012, according to the Britain-based Monitor. The advance opens the road leading from the government-controlled west of the city to the international airport just outside Aleppo to the east, which is also now held by the regime. In Lebanon, the European Union delegation organized a special event against gender-based violence and the head of the EU delegation in Lebanon, Ambassador Christina Lassen, as well as a number of representatives of the relevant associations, showcased some of work and some publications to raise awareness on violence against women and the need to bring to light th this issue and work to prevent all forms of violence in Lebanon and beyond. Beautiful morning at the Corniche. We're lucky with the weather. Uh, we are here, though, on a more serious occasion, as you probably have all seen in the last uh, almost more than a week. Uh, on the 25th of November every year, the UN Secretary General launches his big uh, campaign against gender-based violence with a specific focus on violence against women. And the European Union, we've been supporting this campaign every year. And this year, we wanted to do a little more attention about it. So that's why we invited everyone to come here to the Corniche in Beirut uh, this Sunday, uh, this Saturday morning and uh, for the rest of the afternoon to, to put some attention on this issue that's really very serious because we might think that it's not such a, an important issue but actually the numbers show, appalling numbers show that about 33% or 35%, a third of the world's women have experienced or are on a daily basis experienced violence, whether in form of harassment or actual violence. So we think this is a great initiative. We want to put focus on all of this. The fact that women all over the world, uh, either at their homes, where they experience violence, being harassed on their way to work or at the workplace, is something that we all have to do something about. Because it's not just about the person who actually does this, the person who's violent. It's about all the rest of us as well, all of us who are just bystanders looking while this is happening or knowing something is going on and not doing anything about it. And this is really what this whole campaign is about. So every year we have these 16 days uh, where we focus on this. 
We've made an event here today. We have a lot of the NGOs and UN organizations in Lebanon who are active in this field that we work with on a daily basis. We're all carrying out extremely important actions all over the country to focus on this. As you know, in Lebanon, you have, a, uh, you have legislation about this, and we have a good law in place. But the fact is that in many countries, including in this country, there's often a little bit of a gap between what's in the law and what's actually happening in reality. So we meet to create attention. It's about a mind change, this thing. That's why we're doing this today. Uh, we're very happy that a lot of people are showing up in the beautiful weather. Uh, all of our partners here today have can explain you more about the facts and what we can do to try to change these things. It's something that really, there's a worldwide campaign at all now, it's not just in Lebanon, something that we're focusing on all over the world. And the idea is really very basically just to say enough is enough. Prime Minister-designate Saad Hariri welcomed the Canadian Foreign Minister Stéphane Dion, who arrived yesterday evening to Beirut. Hadidi had, prior to that, welcomed the newly appointed regional director of the IMF's Middle East and Central Asia, former finance minister Jihad Azoud, whom he congratulated and discussed with the economic situation in the country. The custodian of the two holy mosques, King Salman bin Abdul Aziz, is in the UAE as we speak as he begins his official visit to the Gulf countries. The Saudi monarch is expected on Monday to travel to Qatar to take part on Tuesday and Wednesday in the summit of the Gulf Cooperation Council in Bahrain. And of course, he concludes his tour in Kuwait where he's expected on Thursday. Representatives of around 40 countries approved plans to establish a fund to protect heritage sites in war zones and a network of safe havens for endangered artworks in the UAE. A closing statement issued after two days of talks in Abu Dhabi did not specify the total amount pledged for the fund, but French President François Hollande, who was there, said a target of $100 million remained achievable. The meeting, co-sponsored by France and the United Arab Emirates, was spurred by the systematic destruction and looting of archaeological treasures in Iraq and Syria by the Islamic State group. The world watched in dismay as the jihadists systematically destroyed temples and towers, tombs in the ancient Syrian city of Palmyra just last year. And across the Atlantic, Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen exchanged views with U.S. President-elect Donald Trump, who gave him a call touching on strengthening bilateral interactions and establishing closer cooperation between the two sides. This was a statement released by Taiwan's presidential office, where they put out two photos showing Tsai on the phone call, adding that it happened at around 11 p.m. local time on Friday. Tsai took the call with her National Security Council Chief Joseph Fu and Taiwan Foreign Minister David Lee sitting beside her. The two also shared their views about promoting domestic economic development and strengthening national defense so that citizens can enjoy better lives and security without detailing if Taiwan's defense needed were raised in the call. The call was the first such contact with Taiwan by a U.S. president-elect or president since President Jimmy Carter adopted a one-China policy in 1979, a move that is likely to infuriate China and complicate U.S. relations with Beijing. Coming up next, part one of our exclusive interview with investigative journalist Will Fitzgibbon. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching the 1620 o'clock news here on Future Television. After the fifth edition of Free Connected Minds, an annual conference held by the Mei Shijiat Foundation, we sat down with Will Fitzgibbon, a reporter for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism, who conducted the investigation on the Panama Papers. And we talked about the work and meaning of investigative journalism today, the United States government, and WikiLeaks. Here is part one of the exclusive. Thank you for tuning in. We have the pleasure to welcome in our studios today Will Fitzgibbon. He's a reporter for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism who conducted the investigation on the Panama Papers. Prior to that, he was a reporter on ICIJ's Swiss Leaks project and heads ICIJ's Africa desk, coordinating and expanding ICIJ's collaboration with journalists across Africa. 
Before coming to Washington, he worked at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London, where his work on, on politics, the finance industry, and housing appeared in The Guardian and in The Observer. He studied at the London School of Economics, Sciences Po Paris, and the Australian National University. Thank you for being with us, Will. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. In Lebanon, actually, as well. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the main reasons you were here was uh, because of the Free Connected Minds Conference, which uh, Mei Shijia hosts every year. Uh, it's a specific conference for journalism. And you were there to talk about the Panama Papers and how that whole thing started. And I remember, um, you know, I was talking to you a bit about this before uh, the interview. I was reading about, you know, what took me aback a little bit was the whole coordination effort that was made during the investigation uh, on the Panama Papers and how everybody coordinated so well and nothing leaked. So tell me a bit about that. Well, you're right. It was and remains still something that I still surprise myself with. Basically, ICIJ has worked on a number of leak projects now and our modus operandi, if you like, is to persuade journalists that the future of journalism and the way that they can have more impact in their storytelling is working together and publishing together rather than telling one-off stories at a time, which is pretty counterintuitive to lots of journalists. Ours is a profession that is sometimes inherently individualistic and we're used to investigative journalists working in dark back rooms, smoking cigarettes and publishing exclusive scoops. It sounds like such a spy-ish kind of thing. It's all dark and it's all... but. It, you know, we'll get to that. It is and it isn't in a way because um, Gerard Ryle, the head of the ICIJ, said that what the work does specifically is give ground to journalism and it gives meaning to journalism in the way that investigative journalism works. So what is the, what has been, while you were in doing this whole uh, project, what was the thing that struck you the most? The thing that struck me most about Panama Papers was how much this project motivated and spoke to hundreds of journalists from every corner of the globe. Why do you think that is? I think that's because the notion or the understanding that many people have, even if it's just something in the back of their minds, that the offshore system, which is by its nature a secretive reserve of mm -hmm. elites and power brokers, is in some ways inherently unfair. So I think whether or not you're a journalist from West Africa, Lebanon, Japan or the United States, it's therefore something that you're intrigued to learn more about and we hope to re help reform in some ways. It's been labelled the biggest leak in history, 11.5 million files. I have a bit of uh, information here, 4.8 million emails, 3 million database files, 2.1 million spreadsheets from the law firm Mozak Fonseca, am I saying that mm -hmm. right, in Panama, that had reportedly created shell companies that its clients have used to hide their assets. And, you know, uh, this offshore holdings operations, this was a new, you've worked on this before, you had worked on the Swiss leaks. Was this any different? Just or just in terms of its magnitude? It was different in terms of its magnitude, certainly, and I think that was the most striking thing. We're talking not only about a million and a half files, but countries as small as Rwanda to as big as Russia and China. So what Panama Papers did was show the world, those who knew about the problem and those who didn't, that this really was something that wasn't just a part of the world, but a central part of the world, whether we know it or not. You know. The, um, you talked about, it did, it did also kind of put to light, you know, what over 140 politicians and public officials and sports figures, uh, you know, what they were doing. But at the same time, there's been a lot of controversy surrounding them because you did not leak every detail. Why not? The decision of ICIJ and the 400 journalists who worked with us on the project right. was that there was legitimate private information within the Panama Papers that had no reason to be in the public domain. Things like passports and details of minors, perhaps banking details, financial transactions about individuals for whom 
No stories had been written, therefore no context or suspicion of even any wrongdoing was done. Right, but then why, why expose uh, people like Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, China's Xi Jinping, the Saudi king, uh, dealings by the late father of then Prime Minister uh, David Cameron? I mean, you know, you, you can understand why some people would be like, well, if they're going to expose some, then why not expose everybody? Well, I think if you're a politician, be it elected or not, you are in a class of your own when it comes to accountability and transparency. And that's not something that ICIJ and our members have decided. That's something that the vast majority of citizens believe when they vote. That's something that politicians themselves believe when they introduce laws that require asset declarations of politicians. So in some ways, those were the easiest stories to tell because if you're a politician, and especially if you haven't disclosed what you've been doing offshore, then this is something that your citizens and the world at large should know about. The, you know, I think the, the thing that was the most disturbing for people is that many of the leaders exposed tend to have very anti-corruption, uh, try, try to take very anti-corruption measures in their own country. So there was probably a lot of hypocrisy there reported. And I think that's probably what struck most was that like the angle that, so how do you know, you get all these leaks, you're studying them mm -hmm. for about a year, a year and a half. How do you decide what angle to take? Because as a journalist, when you decide what angle to take, there is bias that kind of comes in there, doesn't it? Well, there are certainly cho choices made from the very right. beginning. You're right. When the easy ones, the low-hanging fruit, as I referred to earlier, probably were those politicians because these are people in whom the public has placed trust. You were correct that the hypocrisy in a number of cases really shocked us when we saw politicians in Europe, in Northern Europe, who in some cases had come to power on platforms of transparency, were also found to have been involved in undeclared offshore companies. That was even more outrageous in the public mind than your run-of-the-mill politician. And I think what Panama Papers was also really important to showcase was that corruption, tax evasion and financial secrecy isn't something that just belongs to third world African dictatorships and underdeveloped corrupt countries. What I really I mean found, everybody's involved. Sure. All, you know, not everybody, but And almost. London, Zurich, Geneva and New York City and Miami are some of the prime hotspots of this corrupt offshore system. Did you, were you able to reveal a lot about what was going on in the United States in terms of tax evasion? So did you get, did you get Trump's taxes? Are you still working on that? Is any, anything there? We didn't, not in the Panama Papers. Remember that Panama Papers, as you said, comes from one particular law firm. Right. And we know that that law firm, in its own books, only had one or one point something Right, but as you, as you continue customers. leaks and just generally uh, projects about tax havens and whatnot, do you, you know, generally, is the United States part of that investigation? Oh, absolutely. I think all journalists... What, is you re what, have you revealed, what have you revealed recently? What has the ICIJ revealed about the United States, for example? About the United States? In Panama Papers, there were American fraudsters and mm -hmm. citizens who were involved. That's certainly true. And we know now that the IRS and multiple arms of the US administration are actively investigating Panama Papers. Previous investigations have focused more on corporate tax avoidance and corporate tax malfeasance, if you like, because I think we don't always want to just focus on individuals and, name and naming and shaming. At an individual level, companies are also one of the biggest. When you talk about the IRS and you say, you know, the they're probably getting some, a lot of the info from the Panama Papers. Isn't this work that the IRS does on its own as well, the, that kind of investigative work in order to see what's going on abroad and in order to study specific cases? Well, in an ideal world, I think as, <laughs> in people, at the world. I, at the, at, as people at the IRS have told us, secrecy jurisdictions, also known as tax havens, are problematic because they have legal barriers that prevent groups like the IRS from getting information. What was your goal in releasing that data? What was the goal? Our goal at ICIJ and mine personally in being part of the Panama Papers was telling stories based on the information that would demonstrate that a system that should be working for the benefit of all is in fact working primarily for the interests of a very small minority of people on this planet. What happens now after Panama Papers, and I think we're seeing this, is that governments take up what journalists have now reported on, and they're the ones who have the power to introduce laws, to go after those who've broken laws, and to make the fundamental change that means there'll be fewer leaks for us to report on in the future.
This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our headlines. Iraqi officials say the death toll from a November 24 suicide bombing claimed by ISIS has risen to 92, including about 40 Iranians. Syria's army advances overnight deeper into East Aleppo, where it now controls more than half of the formal rebel stronghold after a fierce assault that has sparked international outcry. And U.S. President-elect Donald Trump breaks decades of foreign policy to speak with the president of Taiwan, prompting Beijing to accuse Taipei of a ploy. Those are your Saturday headlines live on Future Television. Catch us again tomorrow for all the latest, and have a good weekend.